what does it take to invent the next iPhone? Or find the next penicillin? Does it take a genius like Steve Jobs or Alexander Fleming, who in their garage or isolated laboratory had an eureka moment and magically discovered the next big thing? What is the formula to discovering the next breakthrough? It all begins with observation. In 1987, when a group of Japanese scientists discovered an odd DNA sequence in a type of bacteria, the E. coli. These repeated sequences were something that had never been seen before. They are palindromic, meaning they read identically forwards and backwards for about 30 bases and are separated by spaces of roughly 36 bases that are not palindromic in nature none of the Japanese scientists were able to elucidate the purpose of these sequences. Surrendering, they simply reported the existence of the sequences and concluded the study. Some years later in 1990, Francisco Mojica chanced upon the same palindromic sequences when he was studying other classes of single cellular organism, the archaea. They are cousins of bacteria that look similar but have very different genetic heritage and thus biochemistry. Like any good scientist, Mohiko consulted scientific literature and saw the Japanese scientists' findings. Excitedly, Mohiko posited that for the same palindromic sequences to be present in both archaea and bacteria, the sequences must serve an important purpose. He named the sequences CRISPR, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Focusing on the spaces, Mohika painstakingly extracted each spacer and inserted them into a bioinformatic analysis tool called BLAST, the basic local alignment search tool, hoping to identify these spaces with other known DNA sequences. Perseverance eventually paid off. The spaces were indeed a match with DNA sequences belonging to viruses. Why would viral DNA end up inside bacteria? Mahika hypothesized that these spaces encoded instructions for an immune system to protect the bacteria against these viruses. Meanwhile, in 2006, the continued discovery of CRISPR took place in a yogurt production factory that was facing a serious problem. The cultures used to produce yogurt were often attacked by viruses, causing the cultures to fail. A young scientist named Philip Horvath decided to solve the problem he observed that certain strains of bacteria used in the cultures were immune to viral attacks while some other strains could not protect themselves. The resistance was not due to cell membrane mutation but was due to virus DNA sequence within the CRISPR of the resistant bacteria. Horvath carried out a series of experiments that added virus DNA segments into that CRISPR array of non-resistant bacteria that proved the hypothesis that CRISPR was indeed an adaptive immune system a kind of vaccination for the bacteria against the virus, and that immunity depended on a precise DNA match between the spacer and the target virus. Going further, he identified a gene in front of the palindromic repeats that coded for a protein enzyme called Cas9, which is responsible for cutting virus DNA and hence granting immunity. One year later, John van der Woest jumped onto the CRISPR bandwagon. He was the first to create artificial CRISPR arrays, meaning that he could program the CRISPR-based immunity directly with any combination of DNA sequence and instruct the CRISPR system to protect the bacteria against any viruses. In this way, he demonstrated the first case of directly programmable CRISPR-based immunity, an artificial flu shot for bacteria. Adding on, some years later, Emmanuel Charpentier established the full mechanism of CRISPR she accidentally discovered the last essential component of the CRISPR system, transactivating CRISPR RNA, or tracer RNA, which has an important role in the maturation of the precursor crRNA into the crRNA. Hence, in 2012, the field had reached a significant milestone. The three necessary and sufficient components of CRISPR were now known, and the discovery was made. By 2013, CRISPR had become a rising star in the scientific field and many scientists began studying it, accelerating the process of tinkering and application with CRISPR. 
Virginia's Schicksness successfully moved the CRISPR system from inside the bacteria, in vivo, to a test tube environment, in vitro, while Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dotner focused on optimizing the natural pathway, an artificially created single-guide RNA, or sgRNA, which substitutes the function of tracer RNA and cRNA. Now that we know how CRISPR works, scientists began working on CRISPR's real-world applications, gene editing. Several scientists worked on this, but the results were merely modest. In 2013, Feng Chang and George Church came along successfully adapting the CRISPR-Cas9 system for genome editing in mammalian cells and optimized the system to edit genes with an unprecedented level of efficiency and accuracy. With this, it opens up amazing possibilities. One day, we may be able to design the next generation to be free from diseases and ever stronger and smarter. This, my friend, is the history of the discovery of CRISPR as a gene editing tool. From observation to consulting literature, hypothesizing, proving of hypothesis, establishing mechanism, tinkering and optimization, and finally, application. So what does it take to discover the next breakthrough? And what does it entail? Find out with us in the next video.